Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. With more than 15 million copies in print, Canadian-born Frank Peretti is nothing short of a publishing phenomenon and has been called America's hottest Christian novelist. Peretti is the author of 26 titles, including the international bestsellers The Oath and This Present Darkness. As a speaker, he is a powerful storyteller, a compelling comedian, and a thought-provoking theologian. It's easy in this world to get sucked into the loop of instant gratification. We end up looking for shortcuts to the things we want, but God doesn't take shortcuts. There is no shortcut to gaining wisdom or character. God works through the trials in our lives to mold us into the people he has created us to be. Listen in as Frank Peretti speaks on the importance of growth by working through difficult times. Here is Frank Peretti. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray for your anointing upon this speaker right now and upon what you and I have prepared together. I pray in Jesus' name that you would equip and prepare and edify and build this body because they, Lord, are the next generation. They're the ones coming up. They're the ones going to be carrying the ball from here. Help me to do my job tonight, dear Lord. Help me to say what you want me to say. Help me to leave out what you don't want me to say. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You are the body of Christ who's going to be carrying the ball and doing the Lord's work long after people like me are gone. And tonight I feel a real compulsion from the Lord. (laughs) I'm the gray-haired older guy. I turned 59 this month, which isn't all that old. I feel pretty good, you know. Um, my testosterone level is okay, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I am f- filled with the compulsion to tell you what you need to hear so that you can carry on and do your part of the work. It's going to be in your court, folks. You are the church. And so I, I, the, the gist of my talk tonight, uh, just to put in a big old wrapper around the whole thing is, You have to go through the middle. You have to go through the middle. Uh, Where did I get that? Well, you probably recognize it a lot of you. It comes from uh, football. And I I asked somebody, I said, this is Canada. And when I say football, do they think of, you know, soccer? No, football, American football. Okay. Uh, In in American football, of course, you have the line of scrimmage. And you have uh, the guys ready to take that ball and move it forward. And there's a number of ways you can do it. You can fade back and you can pass. You can uh, hand off and make an end run around the line. And hopefully if the blocking is good, you're going to get out of there alive. And you're going to get forward. And another way to go is through the middle. That's where all the big guys are. Guys named Igor, you know. With one eye in the center of their forehead. And they're they're ready to nail you. And and, and, uh, you got to go through the middle. What I'm telling you is what God is saying to you, church. You know what? We are living in an entire culture that is constantly looking for a way to have an end run around life. An end run around struggle, around trials, against hardship. They want to have an easy way out. And God is saying, "Uh uh-uh, you go through the middle. That's how you grow. That's how you mature. That's how you test your faith so that your faith faith comes out strong. Uh, Now, as far as going through the middle, there are three kinds of Christians. Those who have gone through the middle and those who are going through the middle 
and those who have gone through the middle, or will, will, three different verb tenses here. I want to praise those who have, I want to comfort those who are, and I want to warn those who will. You know, there's even teaching out there. We try to be all spiritual and say, hallelujah, if you have faith in God, he will see you through. You'll always get a parking place first time you go downtown. Your kids will grow up perfect. Your roof will never leak. You'll always have da 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 We have all this wonderful way. Of, even if you don't believe you're going to go through the middle, you're going to go through the middle. Now, I just want to tell you that because I want to comfort you. I want to comfort you with this downer message. You're going to go through the middle. <laughs> Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Most of you have already been through the middle several times. Most of you are already there. What does James say? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There's a whole principle throughout the Word of God that God hones us and refines us through the furnaces. Even Jesus went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in preparation for his ministry. David was anointed king of Israel and spent the next several years running from Saul. There's something about going through the middle, going through the middle. Now, it's very important I tell you about all this because, folks, outside those walls right now is a whole world that is trying to convince you that life should be easy. It should be quick. It should be easy. And by all means, it should be entertaining. Computers, internet, iPhones, iPods, texting, videos, DVDs, earbuds, GPS, microwaves, superhighways, satellites, mega bands, mega brands, mega churches, fast food, fast books, fast news, shopping malls, moving sidewalks, escalators, fast media, advertising, consumerism, out of all this whole notion, I should be able to get whatever I want, whenever I want it, with minimal effort, and that includes patience, wisdom, success, and maturity. <laughs> It's a lie. It's a lie. I just want you to know that. The other question, the other thing they try to tell you is everything should be entertaining. If it isn't amusing, if it isn't entertaining, it's not worthwhile. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? This is what he says. I'll read it to you. When I was a child... I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. He says in chapter 14, brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. Well, let's talk for a moment about, well, how do kids think? Well, you know how kids think. Money and toys and goodies were supposed to appear by magic. That's why we had Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to think it through or figure it out. Getting stuff is supposed to be a free ride. Mom and Dad can be manipulated. If I bribe them, if I love them, if I blink my eyes at them, <laughs> if I throw a tantrum, I can get what I want. What's another one? Oh, instant gratification. Yes, I should be able to get anything I want when I want it. No work, no patience. No need to be selfless or to sacrifice. <laughs> no kid should have to wait to open his presents. You ought to be able to eat your dessert first, and then if you have room, you eat your dinner. <laughs> no pain, no sorrow, as little responsibility as possible. You know, it's kind of weird that sometimes, well, actually all too often, you see Christians buying into this very notion and being childish, and somehow they've made it spiritual. You can have all this stuff without any effort, without any time. Let me tell you something about what God really does. In the broad, big picture of our lives, God doesn't just dump knowledge, wisdom, and character into you. He builds them in you as you, are you ready? Go through the middle. You actually have to read the Bible. 
You actually have to learn from life as God guides you. There are no easy, instant gratification, bumpless roads through the Christian life. You won't find them in the Bible. You won't find them in modern life right now. The easy road. Now, let's just start applying this. I want to get down to some practical things. Praise God. Let's talk about money. Money, that's not spiritual. Oh, yes, it is. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be also. Jesus talked a lot about money. He talked about money because you want to know what's really going on in a person's heart? Find out what they're doing with their money, how they're handling it, how much of a God it is to them. Ooh, but money and debt, you know what? There are two fundamental values being taught in our world today. It should be quick and easy. It should be entertaining. What about money? Well, now, you know what going through the middle would probably sound like. Well, that means you have to wait. You have to save. You have to budget. You have to balance your checkbook. You have to learn to do without. You have to think twice before buying things. You have to ask yourself, do I really need it? What does the world say? Buy it now! You can have it now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to be responsible or disciplined or learn to do without. You can have anything you want when you want it. Just charge it. No interest for 90 days, and then we'll clobber you. <laughs> the credit card companies, they know this. It's interesting. Anytime, uh, well, usually it's in the, in the fall quarter at most universities and colleges across the campus they have uh, all the booths set up everywhere of the different sororities and fraternities and the clubs and the organizations on, on campus to kind of get everybody signed up. And on every one of those little, little open booth fair things they always have, there's always Visa and MasterCard. They have their booth set up there. What are they doing? They're fishing. They're like junkie dealers. They're looking for college students who want an easy line of credit. Why? So they can own them for the next 10 years or so. There are college students graduating from college who have more debt on their visa cards than they owe in tuition. They will spend the next 10 years paying those cards off. What does God say in Proverbs? The borrower is slave to the lender. You go through the middle. You save, you wait, you invest, you budget, you do without, you plan. Well, we've got this idea. Well, you can have it quick. You can have it easy. You can satisfy your desires right now without patience, without wisdom, without judgment, and just enjoy. Now, how in the world did we get that idea? Hear me carefully. A lot of it we got from the tube. A lot of it we got from videos. Now we're getting it from the margins of every web page we go to. There is an entertainment factor involved in all of this. It's important. This is going to come up several times in my talk tonight. Entertainment, entertainment, amusement, amusement. Keep them happy. Keep them listening. Keep them watching. Fill their minds. Have influence. Hold their attention. Don't let them get away. Amuse them, amuse them, amuse them, amuse them, because if you do, you can make them do what you want. That's why they even come up with really decorative credit cards. Pictures and balloons and flowers and all kinds of wonderful themes on the credit cards. Why? To make you use them. Eye candy. I talk about eye candy. Um, it's a cinematic term as you're making films and stuff. Uh, the idea is you want to give your viewer lots of eye candy. In other words, there should always be something to look at. The eye should never rest. Boy, oh, you've got cars, you've got flowers, you've got pretty girls, you've got all kinds of things going on. You've got boom, 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 boom. You know, one thing that kind of went out of vogue in video production is a tripod where the camera holds still. No, it's, it's always going like this. You know why that is? It's because they don't want you to get bored. They want to keep you entertained. They want to keep you amused. They want something always going on. And so that's why, you know, sometimes the frame is like this and like this and like this. And, you know, and if that's not enough, they put weird coloration on the black and white. Or they cut to another camera. They cut to this. You've seen it. About a little over a year ago, I started leading worship again at my church. 
And uh, it was kind of an interesting Rip Van Winkle sort of experience. <laughs> I was amazed at how much things had changed since I last led worship. Uh, well, I got up there, and we're going to rehearse with the band and everything. And, uh, you know, it was kind of strange. We met at 6 o'clock to begin our rehearsal. At 6.45, we still had not sung a single note. It was all, could I have a little more of me uh, in the monitor, a little less drums, please? I can't hear Julie's part. Can you turn her up a little bit? The voices are too loud. I can't hear the piano. Hey, the drums aren't working. Where's the drums? Where's the drums? <laughs> 45 minutes we're doing this, and the guys are back there in the sound booth, you know, I don't know what it is they do back there, really. I, uh, no, I, one thing we learned real early is respect your sound guys. <laughs> respect them. There is hardly a more thankless job in the world the guy up here gets all the attention. They're sitting back there somewhere in the dark with all their little lights and sliders and everything. If something goes wrong, then they hear about it. But just to tell you, I began to notice how much our worship had become subservient to the technology. Uh, I was hearing things like, well, we don't have mics enough for that song. We can't hear the monitors. Well, we can't do that song. We don't have a slide for it. Uh, remember to wear solid colors and not stripes. It freaks out the video. Uh, we're all standing up there, and, and right at the top of the platform on a, on a beam, uh, nobody else can see it, but the worship team can see it. There's a sign that says, Smile! So we're all up there looking like an airline safety video. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Your safety is our first concern. I finally told the worship band, I said, listen, don't worry about smiling. You worship the Lord from your heart. Your face will follow. And there's another interesting thing I noticed. Uh, the whole congregation was sitting in the dark. Well, why are they all sitting in the dark? Well, so they can see the screen. Well, why do they have to see the screen? Well, because we have all the scripture and all the words and all the lyrics and all the announcements are on the screen. So they're all looking at the screen. The entire platform was shrouded in black. Why? Well, I guess that's to make the lighting more effective. They're going for the big stadium look, I guess. There. So now we have the pastor and the worship team presenting with bright spotlights in their eyes. Why? So they could be seen in the dark room. <laughs> the only problem was the pastor and the worship team couldn't see the people. And thanks to the monitors, they couldn't hear them either. So the people on the stage... Uh, excuse me, the platform, were cut off from the people in the, uh, uh, the congregation. So what we ended up with was a strange situation in which people would come into a huge featureless room, sit in the dark, and stare at a screen while the pastor preached to a black room beyond the spotlights to people he couldn't see. Where else do we do that? Movie theaters, sports bars, our TV room at home, concerts. There's something very important I just want to point out to you. And uh, i got to be very careful to say, you know, let's not get into the thing, well, is this right or is this wrong or is God pleased? No, blah, 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 wait a minute. I'm not going there. One thing I am trying to point out is where did the church get the influences that are now basically dictating how it conducts its worship. We've gotten it from a theatrical, cinematic, concert, big event-oriented culture. I found it very interesting that in the field of worship, we even have worship stars. We have the top 20 worship songs on CCLI. We used to have a hit parade in secular music. Now we have the top 20. You go to CCLI and you see these precious people, bless their hearts, flash up on the screen, and they look really good. 
This constitutes a major cultural shift as the church adapts itself to a consumeristic, market-oriented, attention-deficient, amusement-dependent culture. These are things that we learned from the culture. And I, I don't want you to come away thinking, well, Frank Purdy's against this. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's fun. But there's just one thing. We used to have a phrase called, there's no business like show business. The phrase is now more correctly stated, there is no business but show business. We as a culture are so oriented to being amused and entertained and watching eye candy and having everything handed to us on <laughs> a video or a, I can't say a platter anymore. Now it's a remote control. That, uh, well, I heard uh, not too long ago one youth leader, he was giving a talk and he said it this way. He said, it's a sin to bore a kid. Can you imagine trying to be a youth leader and live up to that kind of a condemnation? In this day and age, I guarantee you, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many dances and jigs and whatever you're going to do up there, some kid is going to be bored. I, I think we should have good, interesting, enlightening, great stuff for, for kids. For everybody, we're doing it tonight, amen. But here's the tarantula hiding in the bananas. <laughs> and that is conditioning an entire generation to assume that if the truth is not entertaining and cannot be attained with minimal effort, it isn't worthwhile. You see, what can happen is you can fall into a trap where you try so hard to cater to the world's insatiable appetite for amusement and entertainment that the medium becomes the message. It's no longer the truth of God's word that is cutting through and doing the work. People are getting very carried away and preoccupied and prioritizing the machinery by which we present it. And all I can say is, I, I'm going to say this now in 2010, and we'll see what happens in 2015 or who knows how long. But the seeds are now being planted in the body of Christ that are going to sprout and they're going to grow on your watch. And some morning you're going to wake up and wonder what happened. You're going to wonder where that idol came from that's sitting right in the middle of your church. That idol that people must bow down and worship or they won't come to your church. The medium, if you do not control it, will become the message. We hear it in a little bit. Here's a little suggestion of it. I don't know where this thing is going, but hey, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to thus and such. They rock. What's wrong with that? What's the first thing they think of? What's the first thing that draws them? Well, we have to compete with the world. No, you don't. If, if no one's told you this yet, I'll tell you. You cannot compete with the world. It will win every time. You don't have the money. You don't have the technology. You don't have the skill. You don't have a building big enough. You don't have a marketing program big enough. You don't have the millions of dollars that go into some of these big things that people are soaking themselves in every day. All you have is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is what is going to have to do it. Well, let me say it this way. Uh, the Lord God himself gave us a little demonstration of the media being the message. So when Elijah was running from Jezebel, and she was after him to kill him, he was hiding out in a cave. And I love the way God opened the conversation. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, oh, you've 
they've slain all the prophets and Jezebel is after me and now they're taking me to take my life away. And the Lord says, go out to the mouth of the cave. So Elijah goes out to the mouth of the cave and a violent windstorm ripped past the mouth of the cave so much that it busted the rocks up a big storm. And the Bible says God was not in the wind. And then there was a fire. The fire was just sweeping through and consuming everything, this huge fire. And God was not in the fire. Then there was an earthquake that shook everything. It was terrifying, but God was not in the earthquake. Then there came a still, small voice that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? There's going to come a time in your life, especially especially when you're going through the middle, so I'm not worried. You're going to get there if you haven't. There's going to come a time when all the amusements and all the entertainments and all the distractions and all the lights and the smoke and the sound and the iPods and the TV and the videos and all the things we daily digest are not going to bring you the answers you earnestly desire. It is going to be your broken heart before God. Listening in the stillness for that still quiet voice. That's where God talks. Let's go on to false prophets. Whoa! Okay. I'm watching my clock here. I'll just say, I'm going to talk about false prophets pretty quick here. Okay. False prophets. What in the world is a false prophet? Well, there are lots of different prophets out there, lots of different voices saying lots of different things. I just want to tell you that there are some that are actually claiming to be prophets. Uh, Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to qualify myself. I'm from a Pentecostal background. I don't have any trouble with the gifts of the Spirit. Um, so I'm not coming at, at this from any kind of a doctrinal position. I don't have any problem with uh, the gift of prophecy and so forth. That's just me. I want you to understand I'm not coming at it uh, doctrinally critical. What I am coming at it from is <laughs> the Bible warns us time and time and time again throughout the New Testament. Look out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but they're ravenous wolves. Many false prophets will arise. They'll mislead many. Paul warned the Ephesians, out of your own numbers, men will arise teaching false doctrines and lies and heresies. In this particular category, I just want to say, your false prophet is generally going to be the guy who says, you know what? You don't have to have any trouble in your life. You can just confess it away. You can have enough faith, and God will get you through, and there won't be any problems whatsoever. You can go up to heaven and have yourself cut open and little boxes put inside you, and you'll be just fine. You will have a quick and easy... That said, should sound somewhat familiar to you. There was a prophet that told King Ahab, Oh, go on in there and fight them. You can whip them, man. Go ahead. God's going to give you the victory. And Micaiah, the prophet, said, Ahab, he... those guys are going to whip your butt. <laughs> Well, of course, Micaiah, he was thrown into prison. Ahab went into battle because he listened to the false prophets. Well, I don't know about losing his butt, but he lost his head. So there were false prophets who defied Jeremiah. They're always out there. In the I'm going to, okay, I'm 59, all right. Okay, I've been for a lot of decades. Okay, here's some of the things that are coming along. I'll, I'll list them quickly. These are some of the things I've seen. A lot of you have seen some of this stuff. i got to qualify this ahead of time. Some of this I'm not going to just... But I am saying, put a little salt on it. You know, check it out. Look at it from all sides. 
All right, well, let's see. We've had a whole string of faith healers and healing evangelists with their big meetings and their expansive promises. We've had being drunk in the Spirit and Holy Spirit bartenders, inner healing, leg stretching, arm stretching, name it and claim it, speaking things into existence, seed faith, people going to heaven and coming back to tell about it, people going to hell and coming back to talk about it, guided visualizations to the third heaven. Uh, that one uh, guy that had himself all cut open, he's also uh, used New Age visualization techniques to go up to heaven and he visited the apostle Paul in his little log cabin in the woods and learned from the apostle Paul that Abraham helped him write the book of Hebrews. Came back with that wonderful little bit of information. Uh, angelic visitations, God wants you rich, God wants you slim, and now we have angels dropping into meetings, delivering gemstones, and tossing gold dust on people, and leaving footprints and feathers behind. Oh, an angel must have been here. Here's a feather. <laughs> We got angels dressed up like a golden eagle. Winds of change. A pretty woman named Emma. I thought that was interesting. That same cut the guy open. He, uh... What a wonderful evangelist he was. What a prophet of God. He'd go around telling all these incredible stories, and he'd hit people because God told him to. <laughs> Kick people in the teeth, knee them right in the stomach because that was how they are supposed to get healed in his meetings. But he got his cues from a woman, an angelic woman named Emma, who floated into the room about a foot or two off the floor, and, and uh, she was who was guiding him. Remember that scripture about even, de even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light? I want to tell you something. Satan is very, very interested in deceiving the body of Christ, and he will use, are you ready, Christians to do it, or supposed Christians. Oh, now we have oil dripping from Bibles and hands and pulpits and ceilings, angels appearing in campfires, balls of light floating around in church services, ecstasis dancing into altered states, just like Eastern mystics and shamans. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, some of this stuff is doctrinally debatable. Some of it is deceptive and erroneous. Some of it is just plain foolish. Some of it is demonic. I will say one thing that it all has in common. It is all promising a quick and easy Christianity. And it's very entertaining. It's interesting when the Antichrist comes along, depending on your eschatology, he's going to perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, uh, you know, the elect. Uh, the, um, <laughs> and the false prophet is going to, they're going to create an image of the beast, and the image is going to speak. What a miraculous thing. No, it's not so miraculous. Look right there. There's an image, and he's speaking. As John wrote the Revelation, I don't know if he'd ever seen a television before. Whoever wants to take charge of this planet, are you listening to me? Whoever wants to take charge of this planet and deceive the masses is going to do it through quick and easy and through entertainment. They are going to use the technology that we have already created. Anyway, running through that's a whole immaturity. Faith. Oh, boy, okay. Okay, i got just a few minutes. I'm going to finish up. Faith. Faith. I'm going to talk about faith. A lot of people think of faith as a way to make an end run around trial, around struggle. If I just have enough faith, I can get through this. Uh, if I do the right things, if I remember the rules, uh, I'll never get sick. I'll always find a parking place. I'll be blessed. I'll be rich. My kids will be perfect. If any of you have tried that, you've probably been disappointed. Faith is not something that is going to get you around your problems. It's going to get you through them. And it is in those problems that your faith is honed and perfected and strengthened. And I have something very important I want to say to some folks who are hurting out there. I call them uh, God's little helpers. These are the folks that are into this faith will get you around your problems idea. Some of you are here tonight. You've probably been told something like this. Well, you know what? You're sick because you don't have enough faith. Your husband left you because you don't have enough faith. Your little girl died because you didn't have enough faith. 
You're in a wheelchair or you have breast cancer or your business failed because you don't have enough faith. Church, I want it said loud and clear to all of God's people, that is not true. It is a lie. You know what that is, really? That is just laying a guilt trip and shame on you because you can't build up the right mental state to make God do something. That's all it is. Faith says that God will go with you. Faith says that no matter what you're going through, there is going to be a reason for it, and there is going to be a victory in the end. Faith is a deep abiding trust in God that grows and deepens with time and experience. The longer you walk with God, the more you trust him, even when you have the foggiest idea what he's up to. The Christian walk is not a series of explosions. Some people are looking for explosions. Oh, I went to a revival meeting. Oh, I got prayed for. Hallelujah. And then the rest of the week, oh, real life is kind of, no, the Christian life is not a series of explosions. It is a long, slow burn. And faith is forged in the times in between. It's Moses herding sheep in the wilderness. It's Joseph in prison. It's David fleeing before Saul. It's Paul being arrested and then shipwrecked. It's Jacob working 14 years for his wife, Rachel. It's Abraham waiting for a son and just getting older and older and older. And I don't have to tell you about all of Paul's sufferings, the beatings, the shipwrecks, nights he spent in the deep, starvation. He lists all these terrible hardships he went through. But, oh, I love how Paul's life ends. Remember what I was talking, guys, about there's nothing better than being able to look back on a job well done? Here's Paul in prison. He's writing to Timothy. He is about to be executed. His life is at an end. And he says, that's why I'm suffering here in this prison, because of the gospel. But I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Paul lived a real Christian life. He went through the middle. He didn't expect any favors. He didn't expect an easy road. He made that sacrifice. He made up his mind, and he got to the end of his life, and he said, I know him. I know him. There's no easy way to know God other than to Live for and with him and let him show himself to you through the thick and through the thin. I've got some friends. They say, well, how do you define the successful Christian life? Oh, six words. Plod on, plod on, plod on. <laughs> what are the sacrifices of God? What does he really want from us? As the psalm says, all the hoopla and the exterior stuff God's not very impressed with. The psalm says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's what he's really looking for. You know, the whole church could have a power failure, and if God can still get through to your heart, we're still having church. Okay. Praise God. This is how I want to end it with this. I was uh, having lunch with a bunch of college folks. This was a little while back, and uh, we were talking about several different things. And bless her heart, one gal, little gal, she's talking about, oh, I love the Lord. And I said, well, what do you want to do with your life? And she says, oh, I want all that God has for me. I wonder what she was thinking when she said that. Was she thinking, oh, I want signs and wonders. Oh, I want to have great new, just great new adventures in faith. 
I want to see God move in miraculous ways. I want, uh, I'm not sure she was saying, I want to have times of doubt and fear. I want to have times when God just doesn't seem to be there. I want to have times when the things I want so much in life just, they just are beyond my grasp and I can't seem to connect with them. I want to live a life where sometimes I read the Word of God and I say, God, are you telling the truth or are you just lying or am I interpreting this wrong? I thought about that and I thought about all the years that she has ahead of her, all the hills and all the valleys and all the times of triumph and the times of doubt, all the times of difficulty and the times of smooth wheeling, all the times when God is just so close and she can feel his love and the times when tragedy strikes and she's wondering where he is and I'm seeing this going on uh, year after year and I'm seeing her faith being tested and, and what am I going to say to her? Well, <laughs> I guess I'd say this, and I'm saying it to you. Godspeed, young church. God, who carries you as a child, who carries you like a father carries his child, and all the way that you're going to walk, he will not drop you. He will not forsake you. You will see his victory in the end, and someday it will all make sense. You will grow as you go through God's middle. But be wise. Be steadfast. Have your eyes open. Be listening for that still, small voice. And don't be afraid of those quiet moments either. Even Matt was talking about that this morning. Those quiet moments when God can speak to you, you be equipped, you go through the middle, and I guarantee you will make it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for these, your people. I pray for your church. This is the body of Christ, dear Lord, that you've raised up. This is that seed that you will continue to sow throughout the earth. Who knows where these people are going to go from here. Some are going to be in foreign lands spreading your gospel, meeting the needs of the hungry, sheltering the poor and the homeless. Some are going to go back to their own churches, their own neighborhoods. And they are, for the very first time, going to feel that unction and that power to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone they've been afraid to talk to about it. There are moms and dads in this room tonight who have not truly been in love for quite a while, and they're looking for answers. The Lord Jesus is here tonight, and he has answers for you. There are young people who are they're having questions, they're having doubts. There's a lot of anger in their hearts right now because they don't understand life. They don't understand these tough things that have happened to them. Jesus Christ has an answer for you tonight. I'm going to pray for you, dear Lord. Just move. Move in these people. Do a work this whole weekend in marvelous ways that only you can do. And I pray, Lord, grant your people wisdom, godly wisdom for these times. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, May you become fully alive in the love of God.